Today's event features a screening of Eroding History, How Climate Change Affects Black Cemeteries and Resting Places with Andre Chung and Sean Yeos. Today's online program is being recorded and the recording and transcript of the discussion will be available after the program on the Peel's website. The film will not be part of that recording. To hear about future opportunities to see the film, please check out the Environmental Justice Journalism Institute. That website address is ejji.org. A uh, other couple of housekeeping tips, uh, please keep your mics on mute until the end of the program. Then there will be a Q&A with, session with the filmmakers. Um, you can add your questions to the chat at any time, and then we'll go back and, and try to make sure that they get, get answered uh, during the Q&A session. So whenever you have a, a thought or a comment come to mind, don't hesitate to pop that straight in the chat. We'll get back to it at the end. Uh, we do have an ASL interpreter with us um, who will be interpreting throughout the discussion and the Q&A at the end, and there will be closed captions embedded in the film during the screening. I'd like to add that accessibility is a core value at the Peel, so you will find almost all of our programs are ASL interpreted and captioned, so please tell your friends. Our aim is to be accessible to all. The Peel's mission is about amplifying and sharing the voices and stories that too often have been overlooked or intentionally erased from the historical record. So before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that the Peel in Baltimore stands on the traditional ancestral lands of a number of indigenous peoples, including the Piscataway and the Susquehannock. Our work is ongoing to better understand the pre-colonial history of our city and region, and also to support the indigenous peoples who are part of our communities today. You can pick up your free copy of the Illustrated Guide to East Baltimore's Historic American Indian Reservation walking tour map from the Peel, and also download the Guide to Indigenous Baltimore for free, the, uh, sorry, the app guide. I'd like to thank Ryan Coons and the Maryland State Arts Council for the land acknowledgement references they've made available to us and to local leaders like Ashley Minner Jones for ensuring that indigenous voices are heard and recognized in Baltimore today. You can go ahead and sign up for the next two lectures in this series. They'll be on March 22nd and April 12th on the Peel's website. And while you're there, please check out the Candlelight Concert we're hosting at the Peel this Saturday and other, up, other programs that'll be both in our historic museum building and online. Now, without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Shante Daniels, Executive Director of the Baltimore National Heritage Area. Shante, thank you for once again allowing the Peel to present the compelling and insightful talks in the It's More Than History Lunchtime Lecture Series. Please take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. As Nancy mentioned, I am the Executive Director for the Baltimore National Heritage Area. The National Heritage Area's mission is to enhance and preserve the stories of Baltimore's community and the larger area of, of Maryland. We also have programs that are directed at young people, youth, and educating them about the history of their city. So many of our young people are unfamiliar with the hollow grounds of Baltimore, where they're, they're standing on the shoulders of their ancestors. So what we try to do is amplify those stories for everyone, but mainly our young people. They will be our future. We preserve these places for the future and for them. I am so delighted to be able to introduce this program to you um, because it's important that we recognize um, that black cemeteries are in peril. Um, we are in peril because of the environment and our cemeteries are as uh, just as much in peril. This story, I believe, relates to a place that's outside of Baltimore City, but even that means that it relates to us. We live here and eventually we can be in a very dire situation with the environment. So I am so happy to be able to present this program to the public um, and the EJJI, Rona Cabell, um, Andre Chung and Sean Yos are key um, producers of this program 
and they are the ones that allowed us to bring this program to you. So I hope that you will enjoy um, the film. Um, and also write your congressmen, write your state legislators, let them know that funds are needed to preserve these places that mean something to us um, as people of color and the people um, in general. History it does not belong to one group of people. It belongs to all of us. So um, that's my introduction. Um, I would like to say that Andre um, Yost is here. I mean, Andre Chung is here and Sean Yost um, will hopefully join us for the um, program at the end um, to answer your questions. Um, we are also delighted she's here, but she will not be on the panel is Arona Cabell. If you need to reach out to her, you may do so by going to the ejji.org website and let her know of how um, this film impacted you. Um, I think that that's about all I can say for right now. Um, and I'll be on the panel with some answers to any questions that you might have about the Baltimore National Heritage Area and why we do the It's More Than History lecture series. That was amazing. I'm sure you all agree. Um, I would like to invite everybody now to put any questions or comments that you have in the chat. And we're gonna open it up. We're gonna bring Shantae Daniels from the Baltimore National Heritage Area on. Um, Andre Chung is on. And uh, we might have Sean joining us in a bit. Is that right? I'm I'm Sean. That's oh, right. Sean! Hey, great, excellent. Good to see you. Okay, so um, let's get started with just a a couple of questions. I actually, Sean, not to put you on the spot so quickly, but can I just ask you? I understand you grew up in West Baltimore. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how displacement has been a, a part of your personal story and the history of your community and how that helped you connect with the story uh, that's told in eroding history. Sure. Yeah, I'm born and raised in West Baltimore. <clears throat> uh, graduated from Walbrook High School and from my little alter ego sign that you can see, I grew up near Mondam and Mall, obviously. So, um, yeah, uh, I'd made a short film um, that was produced by uh, the Environmental Justice Journalism Initiative called uh, Baltimore, called Disruption, Baltimore's Highway to Nowhere. So, um, this, you know, that, that, that story uh, came before the eroding history story, and that's how I connected with um, Rona professionally. Um, but that, but but the the story of disruption of of people of color, those communities, disenfranchised communities, has been a narrative that has played out throughout my career and Andre's career. Quite frankly, we for our first film together was a film about uh, black farmers in Arkansas and land theft, black land theft. So displacement and disruption of, of of black communities, disenfranchised communities has been a, a, a narrative that uh, we both are very familiar with. So, um, but specifically the West Baltimore angle, yes, the, the Highway to Nowhere film obviously deals with that, that um, really dominant chapter in the, in the disruption of that proud uh, neighborhood, that proud community um, when it happened, so yeah. Yeah. Well, and Andre, you grew up in Washington, D.C. Um, so could you talk a little bit about what drew you to this story on the Eastern Shore and how that connects in with uh, other stories that you've told throughout your career? Sure. Um, you guys can hear me, right? I did unmute my mic, right? OK. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm born in D.C. I actually grew up in Silver Spring, so more DMV than D.C. 
But uh, my uh, my father used to take us fishing on the bay when we were young, and I spent a lot of hours in the boat. And uh, so don't take me off the boat. And um, we uh, we we I, I have a long connection there. My wife and I and our kids we spent a lot of time on the shore, uh, vacationing, camping, that kind of thing, and and getting to know a lot of people there. Um, when when the the genesis for this film began, Sean and I were actually working on another project about the legacy of lynching in the in the state. And we had been traveling from uh, Western Maryland all the way across the shore, talking to some of the uh, descendants, the relatives of people who had been lynched or had escaped lynching, um, some of the stakeholders involved who are, you know, activists trying to get uh, markers placed, soil collections, et cetera. And we were in Salisbury at the time and and uh, Rona and Sean, uh, and Rona's here, she's our producer, Rona Cobell. Uh, Rona and Sean had been working together in Edgy and um, she sent Sean a, a message with a picture of the, of the churches, uh, John Wesley Church and the cemetery there and suggested we check it out. So we had a little bit of downtime in between uh, in between assignments while we were there. We, it was only a 45 minute drive. We went down there, we checked it out. She said, just drive down d Island Road. Trust me, you can't miss it. And she was right. And we pulled over and we spent a few minutes in the cemetery, we made a couple of pictures of the church and the condition of the cemetery really, really struck an emotional chord with both of us. And uh, before we even got back in the truck, we looked at each other and we said, all right, we got to make a film. And so we uh, we kind of understood what the issues were that were at stake right away. And as Sean says, it, it lines up with our our work throughout our careers. This was this was an easy, easy call to make. And uh, the three of us got back together and then we started to plan it out. This was this was this the framework of this was rona's master's thesis and so we we kind of used some of that um she had done essentially most of the reporting and so the trip now was to be able to uh, pull together a compelling story that addressed these three themes that we uh find most important in the film uh which would be sea level rise and how that compounds historic racism and has uh has contributed to the disappearing black communities uh, coastally, not just in Maryland, but uh, around the country and around the world. Right. And Shante, what was it that made this stand out to you as a, a great part to a great experience to include in the It's More Than History lecture series? Well, <clears throat> first of all, the, the, um, the title of this program for the last 10 years has been It's More Than History. So it's more than history. We are, you know, a heritage and cultural uh, organization. But the stories that we bring to you usually touch on a number of different things. So it is more than history. This is about environment. This is about climate change. It's about economic um, disadvantaged people. And so it is more than history. So that's that is one of the reasons why um, this program is important. Number two is we talk about climate change here and how climate change is impacting um, Deal Island. However, in the urban areas, we have just as many issues with climate change as they do in um, Deal Island. We have issues with um, the, the, the tree, um, how should I say the the tree canopy. Um, there is now a big discussion about how much it will cost uh, the Baltimore Tree Trust to plant trees in neighborhoods in order to bring down the temperature in the summertime, in order to cool down the temperature when we are having these exorbitant uh, 105 summers. And now we've got to deal with politicians arguing about um, how much it costs to put in a tree in the ground. This, all of this impacts black people because the places that they're talking about this 
is in black communities. Why are we the last people that get the resources in order to make our neighborhoods livable, increase the quality of life for all people? And you know what? Those trees are going to end up in, in being an advantage. And, I, and you know, I, I step on a, on a ledge here. But it's going to be the advantage of some white people, too, because gentrification is going to happen here. And the thing that gets me is I'm wondering, is it going to be easier for them to plant those trees when white people move in the neighborhood? Tell me. Just a question. That's my point. So what we do with the heritage area is all about telling the stories how do we change the narrative to be at the advantage of all people? We have got to start taking care of one another each uh, uh, from day one. We are a huge connection. We are connected in some way, in some form. And we have got to start thinking about how we can raise other people up and it's going to be an advantage for everybody. Let's be let's be honest. All you know, if you raise one, then another one gets raised a little higher. So really, everybody, everybody uh, benefits. So the lecture series is about these things that should matter to all of us, and it is absolutely more than history. Yeah. Sorry. You, you brought up something that um, I'd just like to open this up to whoever wants to respond, but it uh, this policy, uh, sorry, this film demands policy changes, as you've just said, Shantae. So I'd love to hear about how Andre and Sean and Rona are using the film to drive policy change. And if you've seen any response yet that's encouraging or, or, or already had some impact. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, what we've been doing, we've been doing a lot of community screenings. We've been doing quite a few university screenings. So we're getting it in front of as many stakeholders as possible. Um, we had a screening over at the International Center for Marine Environmental Technology, which is run by UMBC. It's right here on the harbor. These are some of the scientists who really take a look at, at, at some of the issues that we discussed in the film. And, you know, hopefully they can incorporate. Uh, and, and there were a lot of questions to this effect. Um, what we thought were some of the issues that they should be paying attention to and, and some of the ways that they could move forward on it. Um, we, uh, we had another screening in front of the Maryland Historic Trust, um, which, as you heard, did give uh, uh, Chanel a, a, a little bit of money in helping her to renovate John Wesley. But we also call on them to take a closer look at other Black projects in the state. And, um, you know, my challenge to them was, you know, that you can fund these projects outside of the African-American fund. Um, I mean, if the governor hadn't, our current governor, Wes Moore, if he hadn't uh, upped the funding to five million, it was a paltry sum. And if black projects are not being considered outside of that, I mean, you know, where, where do we go? I, I mean, the idea that black people haven't co contributed to the history of Maryland is absolutely ludicrous on its face. Um, I think the current population of black folks in Maryland is somewhere around 31, 32%, which I don't think a lot of people realize. And that's on a similar percentage to Louisiana and Mississippi. You know, there, there's lots of us here and we have a long and storied tradition. Sean can get into, uh, families in Baltimore who have really shaped this city. And, um, and, and so that was a big one for us. And, and we, uh, we also had a screening, uh, I believe it was last month at the park school in conjunction with the lynching memorial project. And uh, we talked with them about quite a few things. And there was a representative from the attorney general's office who came there. And now she's showing some interest to try to get it in front of the attorney general. Um, and we are working our channels in the hopes that we can show it to uh, the, the governor and his cabinet and at least make them 
at the at least make all of these people at the at the very least aware of what the situation is. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that they wouldn't be really inspired to see the film and then inspired by it. Um, so I look forward to to seeing what the outcomes are there. We have um, Reg Bishop who's joined us and um, is asking, in fact, what ways the public, people like us watching today, can get involved to develop an emotional connection to projects in this film and others throughout our community. Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, I think one of the things you can do is is write your representatives, your state representatives, your delegates, your senators, reach out to the people on your county council, your city council, and let them know that you're concerned about these issues. Um, I, there are different groups that you can donate to if you go to edgy dot org, E-J-J-I dot org. Um, we have been raising money for the John Wesley Memorial Fund to help them restore the church. Um, part of the screening fee, well, not part of the screening fee today goes directly to them. Um, if you wanted to contribute it on, on a very direct level, you can you can do that. And and take a look at some of the other projects that are that are going on around you. Um, and and I think the best way is just roll up your sleeves. Fantastic. So let me ask you one other question. And again, anybody can answer um, about the the kind of the stories, the messages that you're telling here. Is there anything that you left out that we, you wish you'd been able to put in? I know time is money, especially in filmmaking. So, uh, yeah. Anything you want to add on today? Oh, my gosh. You know, we had collected so much material. Um, there's we had several interviews that ran uh that developed a lot of stuff i'm not going to get fully into the specifics of everything um I, we were really constrained by budget and length right and one of the things that we were we were hoping to do was to be able to get it aired on public television and there is a there is a number there is a time that is ideal for that, which is 26 minutes and 46 seconds. And uh, so we kept that in mind. And, and when we started, we weren't even looking to make a, a, a film of this length. We were talking about maybe a nine or 10 minute mini doc. Then as we continue to do the reporting, we saw that the story was growing and we thought maybe 15 minutes. And then we played with the idea of feature length um but i think that we would still be bogged down trying to produce a feature length film and we, we settled on where we are so i i'm i'm actually very happy with the film i think that it's it has the right pacing um i think that we've nailed our points i think that we have introduced these communities in such a way that they are relatable and you can connect with them emotionally and you can see yourselves in there and have some kind of investment so to be honest at this point there's nothing that i would add uh that isn't in there and there's nothing i would take out i, I think we got it just right and I, you know i think my team is in agreement i hope they're in agreement <laughs> i'm in agreement i agree i agree no there was a there, we, we to to echo what andre said we could we we echoed, we echoed, we, we collected a lot of material and um, some of those in interviews were very lengthy. Um, so we had a lot of material to choose from. Um, but uh, I think we got it just right. <laughs> I think the audience watching today probably agrees. I'll have to say one of my favorite parts in the film, which is just superb editing. And, and I want y'all to tell us whom we have to thank for that, but which was the back and forth between the white, historic preservation society person and the other interlocutors. And that was just beautifully set up. And just the way you structured it told a lot, revealed a lot. Yeah, I mean, Randy, uh, Randy was uh, our second interview, I believe. And um, <clears throat> he was a controversial interview. I think that would be a charitable thing to say. There is, uh, 
there is a lot in there that didn't make the film. Um, and uh, I, I, he was he was anxious about it. And I think he knew at the end of the interview, because one of the last things he said to us was, please be kind and trust us. We were very kind to Randy. Um, but in the points that he made, what we what we realized uh, as we left, we were like, okay, we have to refute these points. And so we we decided the best way to do it was to do it in the form of a conversation. And so as we did our subsequent interviews, we brought some of those points to the other people that we interviewed. We didn't name any names. Um, and uh, we brought them directly. So when you see that conversation happening, these people are responding directly to the points that Randy made. Um, and uh, we have had some audiences where people were very uncomfortable with the way Randy was portrayed. And again, we were kind to him. But even more importantly, Randy has seen the film and he likes the film. He loves the film. Um, his, his, uh, it, I think we accomplished what we wanted to do because he, uh, he said that he didn't realize how his comments about histories for the readers would land. He hadn't taken it, all of that into account. He said he was very impressed with Vince Leggett over Blacks of the Chesapeake and has expressed the desire to sit down with him and have conversation. And, um, you know, what we did was instead of throwing him under the bus and slamming doors, I think we were able to open some doors and hopefully we can do some bridge building here that will result in, in better outcomes for everyone. Shantae, you look like you want to jump in there. I, I'm just I'm listening because um, having these two um, lifting ideas is basically the, what, what's happening in our history. The people have a different perspective of history. And as you know, their history is black and white. You know what I mean? It is what it is. And I have talked to a number of people that say that we've got to change a certain group of people's minds. And in my opinion, you can't change their minds. They're going to be stuck where they are. So what we have to do is we've got to come together, those of like minds, and we just got to push forward. And what we hope um, to use an analogy that was used in the film is that we erase them off the boat as opposed to them erasing us off the boat. Um, and so I think that it's important to tell these stories. I don't know if people remember, we did a similar story like this last year for Black History Month um, with uh, uh, Chris Haley, who was talking also about how Black cemeteries are in peril. And I'm not quite sure why we continue to be the people in peril. We have very educated people in our uh, diaspora we have very wealthy people in our diaspora. Why aren't they stepping up and saving these places? They're building uh, chicken joints and putting their names on chicken joints and hamburger places and uh, coliseums and all of those things. How come they're not trying to save um, those people that built this country, that made um, things accessible to them so that they could build their wealth? So I am going to stop there because I think I'm just getting ready to step in it. But what I will say is that um, Andre and Sean, we are very grateful for your storytelling. And we are very grateful that you continue to push the needle and show stories like this because we need people to see it. People are, um, in my opinion, people are very visual. Like they said, the guy was very clear. When you see the casket don't going down the street, you know you got a problem. You know, it's not one thing to see just water, but then when you see the casket is the 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 crib is broken, the casket's going down, you know that there is a crisis. Mm -hmm. So as long as you put the crisis in front of people's faces, they can't deny that it's not a problem. 
is when we keep sweeping things under the carpet and acting like it doesn't exist. So your work and Rona's work is extremely important. Keep doing what you're doing. If you got to go back to the to the to the editing floor and pick up some more pieces and make your film an hour after it's MPT, <laughs> then do that because <clears throat> we need to tell our stories. We need to tell them from the people that live it. And you know, we're losing a lot of we're losing a lot of people that have um, the the mindset and the history of it. So while you have a chance, get those histories documented, tell those stories and keep doing what you're doing. And I am ultimately grateful for you to be a part of this program because it's more than history. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do y'all have the, the energy to take a couple more questions from the chat here? Quite sure. quickly, we've only got a minute or so left, but... Um, so we're very interested in um, whether, you know, with so many veterans in the cemetery, isn't it part of the VA's job to preserve those and are they involved? And and then also maybe if you could speak quickly to kind of what outcomes the church wants to see over time and, and what's the, the, the destination that they're on now uh, that the renovations have started. Sean, you want to take any of that? Veterans piece is very interesting. Um, yeah, because I hadn't thought about it from that angle, but absolutely, there are dozens of <clears throat> men who fought and died in wars to defend this country, um, from the Civil War up until the Vietnam War. Um, so it would seem like the Veterans Administration would have a very keen uh, interest in in helping preserve. Um, I've had other people toss around some ideas. Um, as far as the statewide um, inter, inter, intervention is concerned. So um, I, I'm sure that the the, the people of, of Deal Island and specifically the John Wesley community would be very interested in hearing from uh, the Veterans Administration because it, there is certainly a direct correlation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as far as uh, you know, the outcomes that the, the the church would like to see, John Wesley, um, what what they're talking about is uh, is turning the church into a community center slash museum, so that people can understand, you know, as we heard about our Wallace and you know the legacy of this community, to just have something there. That that marks the fact that they were there. You know, James Mo James Baldwin's mother is from this community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there there's a lot of great folks that came there from this community. There was uh, the, okay, so you guys are all familiar with the skipjacks that uh, have been on the bay historically oystering, and a lot of people don't realize that black oystermen are a big part of Bay history. There were only two skipjacks working on the Bay that were owned by black people, black men. And one of them came out of Deal Island. And as a matter of fact, Reverend Wallace's father owned that boat. And um, the boat was called the Claude Summers. And it went out in the 70s. And uh, it got caught in a storm. And it sank. And seven members of the family were killed. William Wallace was supposed to be on the boat that day, but his brother had was on R and R from the Marine Corps and said, "Don't worry about it. Stay in bed. I'll go." And um, you know, as a result, all of these men in the family uh, were lost. And and he told us quite a bit of the history there. You know, he, you can see his bitterness over growing up in Deal Island. And a lot of that is from the racism that his family faced. His father went through it to try to buy that boat. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the white boat owners, uh, blocked his way because their concern was who's going to captain my boat. So, um, you know, there's lots of little different pieces of history that are there. And there is no mention of this, by the way, in the Skipjack Museum on Deal Island, to be clear. And and so there's so many pieces of history, not just Deal Island, but everywhere, that we, we're just losing bit by bit by bit. So a museum is really needed. And, um, you know, as a 
a big fan of museums. I would like to see many, many more museums, especially preserving Black history and all the other stories that have been deliberately suppressed and erased. And if you all want to help the John Wesley Community Association start their museum, Rona has very helpfully put an address in the chat to which you can send a check. No amount is too small. So thank you again. I've let us run over a little bit just because, again, this is so important. We need to be hearing these things. Thank you, Shantae and everybody at Baltimore National Heritage Area for bringing this film to us. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Rona. Um, and thank you for everybody who joined us. Don't forget to check out our website, thepeel.org, for info on upcoming More Than History lectures. The next two are on March 22nd and April 12th. And if you enjoyed this program, please consider making a donation to the Baltimore National Heritage Area to support this and future lunchtime lectures. You can do that at the BNHA website, which is explorebaltimore.org. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks again for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you.